I have just a, a couple of moments to discuss with you why it is that America is a different place. You and I choose the leadership, and it's important for us to understand what makes it unique. If there's a church on one corner that's prospering, and a church on another corner that's failing, there's a reason. If there's a company that's prospering on one corner, and there's a company that's failing on another, there's a reason. And if there's a nation that prospers on one place, and a nation that fails in another, there's a reason. And before we choose a pastor of a church, we should know if he understands what makes churches prosper. And if we choose leadership of a company, we should know how to make a company prosper. And if we choose the leadership of a nation, we should be knowledgeable as to what is required to make a nation to succeed. Half of all the people on earth live on less than $2 a day. Half of those, 1.5 billion, live on less than $1 a day. The second richest spot on earth is Western Europe, France, Germany, Britain. In America, we have a level below which we will not permit a person to sink. That is, if you walk to this country, sit down on a park bench, put your feet up, we will give education to your children, we will put a roof over your head, stamps for food, give you full, unlimited access to the finest health care in the world. In fact, a person on welfare at the very bottom in America, the poorest in our nation, is more likely to have a telephone, a television, an air conditioner, an automobile, eats more meat, and has more square footage space than the average resident of the second richest spot on earth, Western Europe. Now let me assure you, that's not by accident. Why is it that this 4% of the population of the world, 96% the rest, this 4% right here, called the United States, more inventions than the rest of the world combined. Why is the light bulb, the airplane, the internet, the global positioning system, why is it that they were created here? Well, I happen to believe that there's a reason. It has to do with the politics of the nation. And so some people say, well, you know, well, let's don't talk about politics. Let me just tell you, for this 15 minutes, it's the only thing I'm going to talk about. <laughs> because politics works like this. Politics is not complicated. We only vote on two things. We vote on integrity and economics. Politics equals integrity plus economics. What is integrity? Integrity, first of all, integrity means that you can count on a person, you can rely upon it. You say that this platform has integrity. You say a bank has integrity. You say a building has integrity. It, it means it performs the task for which it was assigned that you can rely upon it as trustworthy. And integrity, in my mind, is made up of two things. First of all, it's made up of morality, and I define morality as not doing what's wrong. Shalt not steal, shalt not lie, bear false witness. You honor one another. But as Edmund Burke said, all that's necessary for tyranny to prosper is for good men to do nothing. It's moral morality isn't enough, it's to just not do anything wrong. Integrity, to be count on a person, they also have to have character. And I define character as doing what is right. And so your daughter comes home from school and says, uh, everybody was picking on Sally today and calling her fatty, fatty and all, but I didn't do it, I didn't do it. <laughs> That's good. You didn't do anything wrong. But did you have the character to do what was right. And in, when we choose people to office, let me just point out here, this is going to be a, a rather simple statement for all of you. If you were in the media, this would be a profundity. But <laughs> here, here it is. That is that you cannot do what is right if you're doing what's wrong. You can be moral and not do anything, but you cannot be a person of character and lack morality. You cannot do what is right if you're doing what's wrong. You don't hire a bank teller that's been arrested three times for stealing, and at night he runs a drug operation, and says, but when he's at work, he's very faithful, he's very loyal. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> you cannot have character if you lack morality. So that's when the governor of New York was discussing a recent chief executive of our nation on the Larry King show. He said, I would not trust him with my sister, but in time of crisis, I would trust him with our nation. 
no, 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 no. <laughs> if I can't trust you with my lawnmower, I'm not going to trust you with my wife, I'll tell you that. So, point number two. So, <clears throat> integrity, the second part is economics. Now, over the next eight minutes, you're going to get 90% of all the economics you'll ever need to know. And here it comes, right here. Let us suppose that's 100% of the income of the nation, that's 100% of your income, that's what your salary is for the week, you get $100. If you have no responsibilities, you are free to use it in any way that you see fit. That is, that uh, if you walk into a restaurant and you have $100 in your pocket and everything on the menu is $99 or less, you are completely free to choose whatever you want. However, if I take 25% of it away from you and leave you with 75, two things happen. You have fewer choices. Thomas Jefferson said freedom is having choices, and so as I take choices away from you, you have less freedom. This is a conversation all of us have with our teenagers. You're not going to make that choice because we're going to make it for you. You, have, you do not have complete freedom. The more I take away from you, two things happen, fewer choices and a lower standard of living. Let us suppose I take half of it away from you. Then Fewer choices, lower, this isn't complicated if you're not a politician, you see this readily. Um, let us suppose I take 75% of it away from you, leave you with 25%. What happens? Fewer choices, lower, let us suppose I take it all, and you work all day and you keep absolutely nothing. What is that person called? That person is called a slave. Now, there are only two people that can take money away from you. One is called a criminal. He has a gun. And as you walk out of, the, out of the business place in the pay window and you're walking over to your car, he comes up, puts a gun in your ribs, takes money away from you. The other is the government <laughs> has a gun and comes along and you make it to your car and you open the envelope and you, <laughs> Uncle Sam's already been here. <laughs> now, all of you understand this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause for emphasis. The impact is the same. Fewer choices, lower standard of living. And so you show me any state, and show me what percentage of the income goes to government, you show me any nation, this is published every year by the Wall Street Journal and the Heritage Foundation and elsewhere, what percentage of the gross domestic product of any nation goes to government, and how much goes to the free choices of individuals, and here's the principle. The greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. The greater the government, the greater the poverty. You show me any percentage on there, and I, I majored in economics, and so they said, you know, America's prosperous because it's a good temperate climate and had lots of natural resources, do da do da. North and South Korea, same language, same heritage, same culture, same climate. North Korea, after the 1953 Korean War, got to have complete socialism. Over the last five years, two and a half million Koreans have starved. The roads are all dirt, and you see people walking around, they walk, bend over. Why? Because they eat twigs and grass and things just to fill their stomachs. South Korea, same heritage, culture, climate, heritage, got freedom. And last year had the 10th largest GDP gross domestic product in the world. Free, greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. When you understand that, you can make any rich nation poor, or any poor nation rich. When I was growing up, Detroit was the richest city in America. They chose to pursue a policy of making the city poorer. Out of the 65 largest cities in America, it's the 65th poorest. But you get in downtown Detroit and just drive north, I can blindfold you or else just look out your window, and as you cr cross government subdivisions, you will find the greater the freedom the greater the wealth. You say, well, Bob, why is that? It works simply like this. It isn't complicated. Let us suppose you're going to buy something for yourself. You care about two things. You care about price and quality. And no one can judge that as well as you can. How hungry are you? Do you want to pay that much for a Coke or a sandwich at this time? How, much, how kind of car do I really need? Or do I need an extra Coke? Nobody can, you use your money to the maximum benefit by price and quality. Let's suppose you're going to buy something for someone else. You still care about price because you're paying for it, but you're a little more flexible on the quality. <laughs> Green, 
I think she'll like it. <laughs> Or let us suppose that where you work, anybody that comes in late has to put five dollars in the kitty. At the end of the month, they take it and wrap it off to the, whoever was there. And so at the end of the month, it's the last day, and the boss says, "John, you're going to lunch. Why don't you count the money in the kitty, see what it is, and buy something, and we'll have the dra drawing this afternoon." So you count it out as $150. So you go out to lunch, you're coming back, you think, "Oh my goodness, what am I going to do?" And you look over, and there in the store window is a six-foot-tall stuffed frog. And you go over and you check the price, and it says $149. Perfect. This is great. So you buy the stuffed frog, and you take over and you hide it in the closet. And in the, the day, the boss comes down. He lectures. You know, over here we had people, three people every day were late. We got to quit this stuff. But nevertheless, uh, let's draw and see who wins. And, and little Sally, the new secretary, wins. And says, "What does she win?" You go over and bring out the six-foot-tall stuffed frog. Everybody laughs and claps. Thinks that's really wonderful. Let's take it out, stuff it into her car. She drives home. What is that? That is called. A third-party purchase. A third-party purchase is purchasing something with money that's not yours. Therefore, you care not about the prize. That you will not consume. Therefore, you're not concerned about the quality. The second time, I'm going to pause. By definition, all government purchases are third-party purchases. Made with money that's not yours to purchase things they will not personally consume. Therefore, will there be waste in the highway department? You bet you. Will there be waste in the defense department? Of course there will. That's why we believe, as Abraham Lincoln said, the government should do only those things which we cannot do for ourselves. Why? Because every time we take a dollar from an individual to save and invest and produce to the maximum benefit and put, run it through a pipeline called government, we are in the process of making the nation poorer. And you show me where on this chart any nation stands, and you will find that the greater the government, the principle is. The greater the government, the greater the poverty, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth, and that's what politics is all about. Somebody's going to promise you, "I'm going to make a decision for you. If you just give me your money, I can do this better." We're going to have a single-payer program. <laughs> We're going to have, have the doctor have a single payer. Am I going to be, am, am I going to be the single one? No, you're going to choose. Ah, okay. We, we, we must hustle along. Now, why would anybody do this to their country? Why would anybody take over a prosperous city and make it poor? Why would they take a great country and make it poor? 1978 in Britain, they. International Monetary Fund took over the control of the British pound sterling. The nation was flat on its back. The first thing that Margaret Thatcher did when she got elected was cut taxes, put money back in the hands of the individuals, and the country began to right itself. You can make any poor nation rich. You can make any rich nation poor. Why would they do that? Well, it boils down to this thought: two worldviews, and that is, do we trust individuals to make decisions for themselves? Are they unique and special, or are they people that need superiors to care for them? We will make decisions on their behalf. They can't care for themselves, and that's where America was so special and unique. It came up with this idea: What is the two world views? You know what they are. One of them is that man is in charge. I shall ascend to the throne. I shall be like the Most High. I can do all of these things. And the other is believe that there is a standard that we will have to meet. And brother, with that, you begin to separate the sheep from the wolves. If you believe man is in charge, then by definition, you believe man is basically good. By what standard would he not be good? Do you see how that impacts policy? If you believe that man is in charge, the man is basically good. Therefore, if something goes wrong, it can't be his fault. If somebody comes in here and starts shooting people, it can't be his fault. He's good. It's got to be the gun's fault. <laughs> Regulate that gun. That if children are. People are having children out of wedlock. Your responsibility can't be their fault. It's got to be the fault of the government. Didn't have pass out enough condoms in the classroom. Why? Because man is basically good. Fact of the matter is, we know man is in need of a savior. Finally, we believe man is basically good. His environment. We just. Build new houses. If we just do this, if we just do that, therefore, enough government programs will make life good. Whereas we believe that the individual should be responsible for his own behavior. And from that, you believe that if there, where did your rights come from? Your rights come from because we're good people and because of our group. That our group gives us power. And so these people always speak of individuals as groups. 
Everybody's an Hispanic. Everybody's a woman. Everybody's a this. Everybody's gay. Everybody's whatever. Nobody's an American. Nobody's an individual before God. Everybody's some group. And when they do that, their power comes from their group, not because, as we believe, our rights come from God. Now that distinction, now how does that play out into public policy? You've got the, you understand this better than most. Here comes the next step, is how do you now translate that into public policy? It works like this. You will all, these people will always want more government to do good things for people. Lord knows you don't know how to raise your kids. We need to have them. We'll, we'll do it right. They always want more government. They have an infinite capacity to come up with ways to spend your money. These people want less government. Why? Because they want freedom of choice. They want more freedom. These people always, how do they have more government? Always more taxes. Mayor, governor, president, congressman, you can listen to them for 30 seconds, and you'll know which side of the chart they're on, because they will always say, but for the good of everyone, you must let my hand into your pocket. <laughs> so they will always want more taxes. These people will always want fewer taxes. And of course, the more taxes are never on you. <laughs> How they do this, I don't know. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to tax the oil companies. Now, do the oil companies have a printing press? Or do they collect it at the pump? And if you increase a dollar a gallon on the oil companies, who do you think gets to contribute to that effort? <laughs> and the only way a candidate for president can get away with such a statement is if we're stupid enough to allow him to do it. I mean, that's just silly. All right. <clears throat> These people will always want a weak defense. Every dollar that's spent for, for a, a, an airplane is one dollar less that I can hand out at my special projects. These people will always want to have a strong defense. You say, well, no, 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 no. You, these people, I, I know these folks, they always want less government, and they always want to cut taxes, but when it comes for defense, they're always, they're always spending money for defense. The answer to that is right. Exactly. Because. Why do we want less government? We want less government because it protects our freedom. Why do we want fewer taxes? Because it preserves our freedom. Why do we want a strong defense? To preserve our freedom. Our interest is in freedom, and then the final point would be that these folks have their own standard, therefore diverse lifestyles, and these people believe in traditional family values. Now, how did that come about? Well, there were a handful of folks that got together in Philadelphia and decided to describe from whence our thoughts come. And they said this, we hold these truths, there's enough to get you shouted down on any college campus, we hold these truths to be self-evident, which is a gracious Jeffersonian way of saying, any idiot ought to understand this. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created, equal, and are endowed by their creator. God bless this battery. <laughs> this is not a good thing. That all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among those are what? Life. No, 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 I don't want government involved. You hear a politician being so noble. And this is between a woman and a doctor. I don't want government decision. <laughs> You're in the wrong country, honey, because it says right there in our birth certificate that to secure these rights for this cause, governments are instituted among men, for the preservation of life, not overpasses and sewer systems, to preserve life first. Life, <laughs> then liberty, then the pursuit of happiness. That's what government does. So don't tell me I don't want government involved, then you shouldn't run for office, because in America, our goal is to preserve life. And it makes us unique. Life and then liberty. Now notice the sequence. See, liberty is of precious little value if you're dead. <laughs> and so you need life and then liberty and then the pursuit of happiness. Now at the same time that our founders were meeting in Philadelphia, putting together the Constitution, there was a revolution going on in France, the time of the Enlightenment. They didn't need God as a starting point. But everybody likes liberty. And so they had liberty and then equality. We're going to treat everybody well. We're going to treat them fairly. 
and then we're going to have fraternity. What's another term for fraternity? Group. What's another word for group? Soviet. What's another word for Soviet? Union. So because of my group, because of my union, because of my fraternity, I have rights not from God, but because of my group. And with my group, then I can have equality. How do you get equality? You take from people. What happens when you take from people? They object. What happens when they object? Well, <laughs> and there's the bottom line. You have to kill them. Paul Pot in Cambodia, two and a half million. Rwanda and Burundi with their machetes, 980,000 a matter of 90 days. Adolf Hitler, 13 million. Six million Jews, seven million Catholic priests and others. Whenever Liz and I were in the Soviet Union, we'd always ask, how many people do you think Stalin killed? There was always a neighborhood of 60, 70 million. Our liberal history books say 35 million. No matter how you slice it, it's a potload of folks. 400,000 under Castro. Death. Their program is death. Man, the wages of what is sin? Sin is anything that separates us from God. They don't want God involved. So when they separate us from God, the wages, the payoff, is death. Sin, when it's conceived, it bringeth forth. Yeah, it sounds good, but when it brings forth, what's it bring forth? Death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. What are the ways of death? Abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, right to die legislation, drug addiction, alcoholism. And so you can figure it out in a minute as to where a person stands on these two things. The American Revol Revolution was for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and it had to be tied to God. That's what made it unique from every place else. And so when they had the declaration, they had independence for 12 years, and it wasn't working together because they had 13 countries, 13 different, different currencies, 13 different foreign policies, 13 different tariffs. And so they, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton invited them back to the same place where they had met before to see if they could form a nation. And they met for five and a half weeks, and they could agree upon absolutely nothing. Nothing. 50% of the people lived in three states, 50% of the people lived in 10 states, there's no way around that. Five states said, we don't want to abolish slavery. Eight states said, we didn't fight for freedom to, to have slavery. There was an impasse that absolutely could not get over. George Mason, George Washington's best friend and next door neighbor got in his carriage and started to leave. George Washington walked along beside the carriage pleading with him not to leave. He said, we've got to do something. He said, George, I, I have other things to do. We, we can never resolve these things. And so they went back and met in the same room, and the fellow that spoke for the first time was Benjamin Franklin, who one of the three signers of the Declaration that were part of the Constitutional Convention. And he, 83 years old, negotiated the peace treaty in, for America in 1783, elderly, ill, and he got up to speak for the first time, and he said this, Mr. President, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks is proof of the imperfection of human understanding. We have gone back to ancient history books for models of government and examined the different forms which now exist. Let us stop for a moment. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. You can teach a 12-year-old how to drive. You don't give your keys to a 12-year-old. Why? Because he doesn't have the proper use of knowledge. Where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from only two sources. It comes from experience, your own or someone else. That's why you want to study what? Listen to your elders, wisdom. But the scripture says there are some things we haven't done before. If any man lack wisdom, there's another source. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And some of, if you've never gone through the seventh year of a marriage before with a five-year-old and a three-year-old, if there's things that we've never done before, then we call upon the source of wisdom. And so he said, we've gone back to ancient history of models of government and examined the different forms which now no longer exist. We have viewed modern states all around Europe, but find none of their constitutions suitable for our circumstances. In this situation, groping in the dark to find political truth, we have not once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. We're crawling around here in the dark, and nobody has bothered to go over and flip on the lights. Now let me tell you, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers were heard, and they were graciously answered. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? Sir, I've lived a long time. The longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. 
If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire could rise without his aid? Therefore, we have been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. I therefore move that prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. And with that, they recessed. For three days, went across the street, for three days of fasting and prayer, came back, began each session with prayer, and over the next five weeks wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, creating the oldest government on the planet. Every government on earth has changed since that time. It's been available as a template, and in my opinion, it continues to be the apex in human government. And so our founders said this, let us recognize from where our wisdom comes, therefore Congress shall never meet for five minutes. If it meets today to take a message from the Senate, if it meets today to take a message from the President, and the, the, the speaker will bang the gavel, the prayer will be asked, the message will be received, and they will adjourn. Congress in the United States of America has never met for a moment without first acknowledging our dependency upon God. Then we will say that no person shall hold a position of public trust without swearing allegiance to God, on the, from dog catcher to president of the United States. Every official document shall say done, and this, the year of our Lord, 2008, that we shall put on our money that is in God in whom our trust. That is the motto of this country, that we recognize that our dependency is upon him. I think I'm getting the hook. <laughs> I am sorry. All right, give me. Let me conclude with this, and I apologize, I should have been watching my time. 200 years ago, Alexander Tyler, Scottish jurist, said, the average age of the world's great civilizations has been 200 years. The nations have progressed through this sequence, and this is where you come in. It goes from, and we all know this, from bondage to cry out to God, in, in Egypt or wherever, and then to spiritual truth, from spiritual truth to great courage, righteous or as bold as a lion. From great courage, it leads to liberty. And from liberty, it goes to abundance. Now, 15 minutes ago, I said, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. 200 years ago, he said, the greater the liberty, the greater the abundance. From abundance, it leads to the second generation. I just want to preserve what I got. Daddy built it. That's fine. I'll just enjoy it. From selfishness to complacency, I really don't need to get involved. Bless me, my wife, bless John, his wife, us four, no more, amen. We don't need to, get, and we don't need to be involved in that. Those are two controversial things. I, I have a more noble calling. And so complacency we set back during the 1950s and the 60s when this, the greatest lighthouse for the gospel in the world, as they begin to undermine and eat away at the foundations and we just didn't want to get involved. And then from complacency to apathy. Now, what's the difference? Complacency is I don't want to be involved. Apathy is I really don't care. I know what the president's doing, but you know, I just don't, I don't care about that. From apathy into dependence, the only thing I care about is, is how much uh, is there going to be a drug benefit in Medicare for grandma and whether or not there's going to be a special contribution for our college kids to get a, the government going to pay for them because it's kind of a struggle. We go from dependency and back into bondage. Now, my friend Rabbi Lappin says that never in history has a nation gone through this cycle and ever gone back from dependence to apathy, complacency, except Israel. To which I respond, and there never was another nation founded on the word of God except the United States. And by calling upon God, this nation can, can once again be revived to the principles that made it the lighthouse for the world. God bless. <laughs>